So good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for joining again. <clears throat> so we will continue now with uh, a panel on term rates initiatives. And I'd like to welcome again Yap Kees from ING and Alberto Lopez from EMI. And then I have here to my left Dominique Limasson from BNP Paribas, also um, she's senior coordinator for European market infrastructures and chairing, BNP is chairing one of the subgroups of, of the working group on term rates. Then we have uh, next to her Michele Mazzoni, Senior Officer for Market Integrity from ESMA. And then here right to my left, Chiara McGonigal, who's Assistant General Counsel at ISDA. So um, I should say that again, we will, um, would like to use the Mentimeter tool for you to ask questions. By the way, we have already collected a lot of questions. Some are also, I think, relevant now for this topic. And I will um, get back to you um, la later today to see what we can do with all these questions, which we don't have necessarily time to answer today or who may be a little bit too technical. So I give the floor first to Alberto on the URIBOR reform. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelia. <coughs> so, uh, so I guess in the morning I had not bad news, but at least realistic news about uh, Ionia. So I hope to bring some comfort with regards to, to Uribor now. So this part you know, so Uribor is a major interest, uh, your interest reference rate. It is administered by, by uh, EMI, and is currently calculated from the contributions of a panel of 20 uh, banks across Europe. So uh, Uribor was uh, categorized as a critical benchmark by the commission given the European Commission, given its uh, importance for financial stability and because of the uh, wide use across uh, a number of, uh, of financial contracts. So what you can see there is uh, so just to, uh, I guess, to, <laughs> to show you how important it is. So this is a, a quantitative mapping exercise that the, the working group made uh, at the very beginning of, of, the, of the efforts. And what, uh, what it shows is, so taking into account the, the 2020 deadline that we were discussing in the morning, uh, how much of all those uh, contracts by asset class would be outstanding after 2020 uh, if, the Uribor, or if the reform were not to be successful, therefore uh, Uribor would not be deemed complying with the, with the regulation. It's only just to, to show you how, how crucial it is that, uh, that the Uribor reform uh, succeeds. So according to, the, to that quantitative mapping exercise, uh, the depth of the Europe reference market is uh, of about, I mean, about 62.6 .6 trillion euro of Euribor linked financial transactions will remain outstanding on the 1st of January 2020. So taken, taking this into account, or, and not only, but also the recommendations of uh, IOSCO and the FSB uh, back in 2013, uh, Amy started the Uribor reform. So the Uribor reform uh, was not only, it is now focused on the methodology, but Amy has done a lot of, a lot of work in, the, in enhancing the transparency as well as the whole governance and control framework of the Uribor benchmark uh, uh, resetting process. So the ultimate goal of the reform was to evolve the current quote-based quote uh, determination methodology to a fully transaction-based methodology in order to provide the, the market with a more transparent, robust, and representative uh, index. And that was the work that EMI did for over three years. So since the first recommendations from, from, uh, from IOSCO and the FSB were, were published, we conducted two big uh, data collection exercises with the panel banks back then, and not only the panel banks, also with the support, with the technical support of the ECB, to assess and uh, develop a fully transaction-based methodology. That was 2013, 2014. In 2016, a few months prior to the implementation of the, the methodology, we rerun an analysis to see whether that fully transaction-based methodology would still make sense under the current market conditions. And the conclusions were published on the 4th of May, 2017, and were that given the current market conditions, so the liquidity in the market, a uh, transition from the current, uh, current quote-based methodology to one fully based on transactions is simply uh, not possible. It's not, not robust. So on the basis 
of, um, of those results, those findings, Amy has been working since the summer <coughs> last year, so 2017, on the development of a hybrid methodology for Uribor. So that's a, a methodology that calculates the submissions of the banks based on three different levels, so it's hierarchical levels that you can see on the slide. So first you have, a, so I mean, do not forget that the regulation asks us to define a methodology that is anchored in transactions to the extent possible. So I guess that we are relying on the to the extent possible. So first we have a level that is uh, based on transactions that satisfy certain criteria that EMI has defined and that reflect what uh, your driver's underlying interest is. Then we have a second level that is also based on transactions but are adjusted either are adjusted to fit the Uribor curve or reflect or they are brought forward from previous days. So level one uh, submissions from previous days would be considered as level two input for today. And then there is a, a third level that relies on transactions that have not been used in any of the previous two levels, as well as, as other market pricing sources. Uh, and what the panel banks are supposed to do with all this information is to, to estimate their cost of funds according to guidelines provided by ME. So this is the methodology that, uh, that we developed. It was developed together with a task force of market experts. Uh, the FSMA, so our supervisor, uh, participated as an observer in the efforts of the, of the task force. And uh, the, this methodology was the, was the main point of uh, first consultation that was published at the beginning of this year. The feedback that we received uh, in response to that uh, consultation was positive. It was supportive of uh, our, our efforts. And then we continued by testing this methodology with uh, real data, so under life, under life conditions. So that's, uh, so before I've referred to the pre-life verification program, so what we conducted this summer was the hybrid driver testing phase. So it ran from May until the end of July 2018, and uh, three, mon uh, three months, no, three weeks ago, on the 17th of October, Emmy published a second consultation paper that uh, presents a summary of the findings uh, from, this, from this testing phase. And it also discusses EMI's uh, proposals for the different methodological parameters uh, that had yet to be defined. So the consultation period is still open, so I would encourage you to go to EMI's website. It may not be as fancy as another uh, web page that has been referred to previously, but uh, you can find the document there and we would encourage really to read the consultation paper and uh, send your responses. So it is very important to get the feedback from the market because it is very likely, it is for sure that we are gonna go forward with the methodology. So it is important to get your feedback. Um, following the analysis of the data and uh, the submissions that were collected as part of the, of the hybrid driver testing phase, we are confident that the hybrid methodology is a robust evolution of the current quote-based non-compliant with the BMR methodology. And in turn, this methodology, the hybrid methodology, has a lot of potential to be compliant with the regulatory requirements of the BMR. So EMI's calculations indicate that, uh, so there were a lot of rumors about the spread and the volatility, and this is information that was published in the consultation. So our calculations based on the data that we received uh, indicate that the hybrid methodology uh, yields a rate which presents a natural market-driven uh, volatility that uh, across all maturities ranges between 0 0.5 basis points and one basis point. And uh, in terms of average spreads between URIBOR calculated with the current quote-based methodology and uh, URIBOR calculated under the hybrid methodology, we estimate that, uh, or we estimate that across all maturities, uh, this spread ranges between minus five basis points and minus one basis point. So the Belgian FSMA uh, commended uh, EMI on the work done to develop and test the hybrid methodology, and they indicated that it represents a significant step towards an EU BMR compliant driver. So in the last meeting of the Euro RFR working group a few weeks ago, they also mentioned that uh, it they would make an effort 
to expedite the authorization process once EMI files for authorization. Uh, an important prerequisite for the FSMA would be the assurance that panel banks are operationally ready and willing to contribute under the new hybrid methodology. When it comes to the implementation of the, of the methodology, it will be phased. So the phased implementation of the methodology will occur uh, during 2019, and we intend to apply for authorization <coughs> to the Belgian FSMA by Q2 2019. So that's well ahead of the two-year long transitional provision period that is contemplated under the EU BMR. So all in all, it's better news than for Ionia on our side. Thank you very much, Alberto. Please, again, if you have questions, you can put them already now in the, in the Mentimeter tool. Mm. So we would move on and give the floor to Michele Mazzoni from ESMA on the written plans. Thank you, Cornelia. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'm here to talk about a single uh, BMR uh, requirements, which I believe affects most of you in the audience, and is uh, BMR Article 282, the content of which is in the first uh, slide. Uh, before looking at the content, I would like to clarify uh, a couple of things in relation to this obligation. <coughs> first, it applies to all benchmarks that are in the scope of the BMR. That's for it apply also to a RIBOR. We just heard from Alberto the plan for uh, authorization that EMI has uh, developed. Uh, it's important to understand that this obligation apply before authorization, after authorization, in case a RIBOR is authorized, in case not authorized, it apply in all cases. And the second point is that, and I hope you're already aware of this, this obligation applies since 1st January 2018. So it's been applicable in the last 11 months and in case your organization is not up to speed with this with this obligation i, I will urge you to to uh, implement and fulfill this obligation uh, as soon as possible now uh, as concerned the, con the content of the obligation as you can see it affects supervised entities this is a term defined in bmr so in case you're a supervised entity and you use a benchmark also use of a benchmark is a term defined in bmr so if you tick these two definitions, what you have to do is to produce uh, written plans that are sort of contingency plans that include your, uh, the action you will take in case the benchmark you are referring is materially changed or ceased to be provided. The obligation, uh, these requirements continue and say that where feasible and appropriate, this written plan has to include alternative benchmarks. I think this is a, an important uh, paragraph also to consider in relation to the current arrival uh, circumstances. And then, last but not least, uh, this written plan should be reflected in the contractual <coughs> relationship that you have with your clients. Now, this is the text of the BMR uh, Article uh, 28.2 that has, said is has been already applicable basically for the last uh, 11 months. At ESMA, what we have done is to issue a couple of Q&As that you can find on our website. You have the link at the bottom of the slide that try to help market participants in implementing this obligation. So in the first one, we provide some flavor, some additional details of what, what a written plan can include. Uh, while in the second, we, we explain that this term that we have seen in the previous slide, contractual relationship with clients, is something governed by national law because contractual law changes from member state to the member state. However, uh, and I'm reading, uh, so the, our guideline, uh, our Q&A provide uh, some general principles that you should follow. And in particular, the fact that the supervised entity should be able to demonstrate to the competent authority that you have communicated the written plan to the clients and that such written plans are legally effective under the applicable national law. So, uh, now the question, I think, is how to best reflect this contractual relationship, this uh, written plan in the contractual relationship with clients. And I think uh, we all agree that the best way is to include fallback clauses in the contracts that you have with your clients or in the financial instruments that you issue that reference a benchmark. And in this respect, I want to point out a couple of things. 
uh, I believe that the the European the Euro Risk Free Rate Working Group is considering uh, whether it is in a position to provide some public guidance on how to include fallback clauses in new contracts. So in case this happen, I will suggest you to check the ECB webpage dedicated to this working group because you can have additional input and, and guidance on how to fulfill this requirement. While in the in the derivative space, uh, and I don't want to anticipate the, the presentation that ISDA will, will, will make in a second, but uh, uh, ISDA published a document in September that is called the Benchmark Supplement, which was developed on the basis of this BMR article 28.2. So as concerned the derivative space covered by ISDA agreements, there is already a public document which I think is very good in, in, in order to fulfill uh, uh, Article 28.2 of the benchmark regulation. So to recap, you have a, uh, a BMR requirement that is already applicable. You have the text of the, uh, of the level one, the benchmark regulation, where ESMA will issue some guidelines, uh, some Q&As. Uh, you have already needs the documents that cover these requirements. Potentially we have additional input from the working group. And uh, if you have additional uh, question on how you can fulfill this requirement. I suggest you to contact the national competent authorities uh, of your country. You can find the list uh, in our uh, ESMA website. And I think that's all from my side. Thanks very much. So I hope that was useful information for you in order to prepare for this. Um, and I understand also the working group plans yeah. to say something on this eventually. So I hand over to Dominique to update us on the working group. Thank you, <coughs> Cornelia. Um, okay. So, um, to start this presentation, I must uh, tell you uh, how, how happy I am today to present <coughs> you uh, the work done by World Group 2. As uh, since the last uh, six months, we did uh, a tremendous amount of work, and uh, you will see the results. and. Uh, uh, thank you for that, for the whole participants of the work group too. So, uh, to start with our mandate, this was a, an important step for us. So our mandate is to explore the uh, a fallback, the possible fallback arrangements for Euribor. This is, this, this is very important because we've been talking extensively about uh, the Euribor reform and uh, uh, Alberto just presented us uh, the last reform. So, uh, one hour, um, uh, assumption in, uh, in this working group is that the Euribor reform will be BMR compliant. We, ha we need to have to work on this assumption. So we're working on a fallback. Uh, so the job is to determine and recommend uh, a term structure methodology for a risk-free rate uh, fallback for Euribor linked contract. It's, it's, it's key. I mean, each word accounts for, uh, has counted for the work with that we have done. Uh, with ING, we put in place what we call a high-level implementation plan, and in that there were actually three missions, I should say. The first, was, the first one was to define the selection criteria for term structure methodology. So it was, this is, has been a long process and a lot of discussions, very interesting. Then to assess the term structure methodologies against the selection criteria, so to assess the uh, uh, the methodology, this has been a long technical work uh, because we had to uh, imagine effecti effectively not solution like in the subgroup four, but uh, methodologies based on technical assessments. So it's been very interesting also, but very long, very long work. And finally, which will be the last part, almost the last part of our job, will be to organize a public consultation. And I can tell you <laughs> that this one <laughs> is not <laughs> the best part for, for us because uh, we are not used to, to organize a public consultation and to ask the right questions uh, around this. So we will, we will, in this consultation, we will propose our select, selected approach, but we will also be totally transparent on the, the way we've been working and uh, the other, of course, methodology that we've been uh, uh, working on and uh, thinking about a lot. And then that we, have, we have a few questions and we will take into account your remarks. So, um, the second on this, all this work has been done in a certain background or context. 
as I said, the first one was a uh, Uribo reform. It was very, impo very important for us to know exactly what will be the future of the Uribo and, and to have an assumption on that. So now we, are, we have more information, I should, I should say, even if there is still a, a risk for Uribo not being compliant, but this is not our, our job to judge this. The second one is the Ionia Ester transition. Why is it so important for World Group 2? It is that to, um, to, ha to make as a methodology working, we need to have a liquid derivative market. If we don't have a liquid der derivative market, we, cannot, we can uh, imagine other, me other possible methodologies, but it will never work. So this is, this is its key, and that's why uh, for, for us it is important that uh, transition <coughs> is as quick as simple, as efficient as possible. And uh, Carlos explained that very well uh, this morning. And then we have some uh, other uh, groups uh, working on benchmark. We have, uh, of course, the FSB recommendation that all we must take into account. We have the ISDA consultation that uh, will be exposed uh, after, uh, after I finish. So also it's important for us to coordinate uh, closely with ISDA. Uh, and also, we have the work done by other uh, jurisdictions, other work groups, uh, citing mainly uh, the ARC and the SONIA group. Uh, actually, we are developing uh, some relationship and some coordination with them. Why is it important? Uh, because we, I don't know, but we all do uh, cross-currency swaps, and when you do cross-currency swaps, you have two index, so we need to be coherent somewhere in the, in the, um, in the methodology we will choose. Even if for these two groups, they have a different uh, mandate and they have a different uh, uh, things to, uh, to sort out that us and to don't really work on fallbacks. But this is another, could be another session. So, um, having said that, uh, I wanted to, uh, we wanted to show you uh, effectively uh, what has been done f uh, as far as now. So the first work was on selected criteria, as I said. So globally, um, globally, you will find a lot of very precise and detailed documentation about uh, work group two work on ECB site. Uh, so this was not the purpose today to go deeply into details. So on this slide, you can see the, all the criteria that had been selected. Globally, uh, it corresponds to three big IOS core principle, the data sufficiency, the benchmark design and transparency and um, of benchmark, um, sorry, determination. So this was the three main points and we've, work, we've been working actively on this. So once these criteria criterias were fixed and we all agree on, uh, on these criteria, uh, we had to assess these criteria versus uh, the different methodologies that we have working on and these are the methodologies. So you, you, will, you will find uh, the methodology that have been uh, also proposed by other work groups, actually. So the first one is the future-based. Second one is the OIS quote-based. Then we've been working on the OIS transaction-based. Uh, we are also working, but we start a bit late to work on this, so it's not, uh, I don't want to present it today on the a composite methodology, which is a mix of the OIS quote-based and the um, OIS transaction-based. Uh, we presented this methodology at the last uh, plenary session on the 18th of October, so also you can find all the details on the site of ECB. Um, but for the moment, we're still working on it. It's, uh, it's, it's not so, uh, it's quite complex. Uh, the, last, uh, the last thing is, uh, so these this three or four with a composite uh, methodology are forward-looking uh, methodology. And the last part is concerning is the backward-looking methodology. So backward-looking methodologies is very specific. We know that um, in the ISDA consultation, you focus a lot on, uh, on this methodology because you focus on derivative, actually. Uh, don't forget that we on uh, working on a new methodology for uh, Euribolink contract means that you work a lot on cash products because it's uh, really widespread. So we favor uh, the forward-looking methodology for the moment. We're still working on the backward-looking because we need to, uh, to also show uh, some um, 
um, some clues on, on these methodologies, but globally, as we think that we, we need to show one methodology, to choose one methodology as a fallback, as a fallback, huh? this is important, um, we, we will rather uh, favor a forward-looking methodology. Um, so this is the work, on, on this slide you can see the pro and cons. I'm not going through it because we don't have really uh, time for, for that, but we are available for more details. If you need, you can call one of us. So what is now the next steps? So you can consider that job is done. Huh? We work on methodology, we can recommend one now, we're almost ready, but it's not finished yet because as a matter of transparency, as we said before on, uh, uh, on the rest of the work, work done by the work group, it is very important for us to share uh, our work, to share all the assumptions we've been working on, to share the methodology, how it how has been built with you, with the market. We consider already that in the work group you have a large amount of expertise and a large part of the market which is represented. But don't forget again that on, on a Euribor re, uh, fallback, uh, the, use, the end users uh, are very widespread and go uh, into the retail, uh, retail space. So it's important to communicate on this. So as, I, as uh, it is said, no? see, see, no. uh, the scope is to, uh, to validate uh, a recommendation, so we will recommend one methodology, then we will ask you to validate uh, first by the working group, first by work group two, then by the work group, the whole work group, and then we will go public with a few questions, not too much. And this will help us because we will have with your feedback and this will help us to make to maybe go on additional analysis. We just want to be sure that we didn't forget anything. So, um, to conclude, um, we have to, again, to coordinate our efforts with all the um, uh, initiatives that are taken on benchmark, on other jurisdictions, but also by groups like ISDA. This is very important. We have to uh, go on having extensive discussion into the work group on term structure, even if we consider that we are well advanced and we think that we have, uh, we have been studying all the actual possibilities. And then finally, we will consider our job is really finished and that we, we can recommend a methodology uh, when we will have the feedback from our public consultation and uh, maybe we will have to go into further analysis. Voila. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Dominique. So uh, it's really a very complex task to think about the development of term rates, especially with all the uncertainties that we still have and also in conjunction with the other jurisdictions where they're looking at similar problems. So we can also learn from them, of course, but um, yes. we also see how we can coordinate. So um, ISDA is very active globally on um, issues related to IBORs, uh, developing fallbacks and so, uh, transitions. So I give the floor to Kieran. Great, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present today on IBOR's work across a number of different benchmark initiatives, including um, work to improve the contractual robustness of contracts that are linked to um, key IBOR, such as, such as your IBOR. Um, before I begin, I think anybody who's been to a, an ISDA conference or seminar on benchmarks has probably seen some version of this slide. Um, but I think it's useful um, in attempting to differentiate between the different benchmark initiatives um, that ISDA are involved in. Um, before speaking specifically about our work on uh, IBOR fallbacks. <coughs> so broadly speaking, we distinguish or, uh, or distinguish between, I suppose, three different um, types of initiatives. So the first one is IBOR transition, um, and then we have the IBOR fallbacks work, and then we have our work on fallbacks related to Article 28.2 of the European uh, Benchmark Regulation. So um, I, I think within those categories, it's probably uh, useful to distinguish between two broader categories. So one, the voluntary transition process, which we expect to happen during the lifetime of an IBOR, uh, which is clearly the work being done by or led by 
uh, the working group on euro risk-free rates in the eurozone and other uh, public private sector groups in other jurisdictions. And then the work on fallback, so emergency provisions which are intended to be triggered upon the permanent discontinuation of a rate such as a, a key IBOR, like, <coughs> excuse me, like your IBOR. Within the category of fallbacks, again, two sort of categories here. So um, on the benchmark supplement first, um, just, I suppose, um, following up on Michele's presentation, we have developed a series of fallbacks um, driven largely by the requirements under Arti Article 28.2 of the European Benchmark Regulation, but the benchmark supplement is intended to be global in scope. It doesn't just apply to those rates which might be subject to the benchmark regulation. And what the benchmark supplement does is that, that it introduces um, fallbacks into uh, derivatives, uh, as the product definitions booklets, to the extent necessary. So identifying products where the existing fallbacks are either not robust or where fallbacks don't exist at all. The benchmark supplement introduces um, a waterfall of fallbacks. So, so the way that works is that if there is a disruption to one of the rates that's referenced within a contract, uh, the parties will first attempt to agree upon themselves what the rate replacement rate should be. If they can't do that, they will look at any replacement rate that might have been nominated prior to entering into the transaction. If that doesn't work, they may look to any replacement rate that might have been nominated by a regulatory authority or, or other body. Um, if that doesn't happen, they can move to calculation agent adjustment and, and failing all of those steps, um, the parties can elect for a no-fault termination, which is clearly not a great outcome, but probably better than the alternative, which would be the operation of an unrobust fallback, which might require parties to go out into the market and obtain quotes, or even worse scenarios where there are no fallbacks at all and you may end up with uh, contractual frustration. So separately, and this will be the focus of my talk today, um, is has been engaged at the request of the FSB's Official Sector Steering Group um, to work on uh, fallbacks for specific uh, key IBORs, so work towards improving the contractual robustness of contracts which, which reference those by incorporating fallbacks um, into our 2006 ISDA definitions um, to introduce uh, appropriate fallbacks for um, trades referencing those, those key IBORs. Um, before I move on to that, I, I suppose it's, it's useful to um, explain a little bit around how the benchmark supplement and the IBOR fallbacks um, interact. So the benchmark supplement has been published, so to the extent that people enter into trades today, um, referencing the 2006 is the definitions, the benchmark supplement will be incorporated into those trades, the fallbacks will apply. Uh, for legacy trades, uh, we're anticipating publishing a protocol at some point in the next couple of months that will operate by introducing those amendments to legacy trades which reference um, the, the relevant product definitions. In respect of the IBORs, the benchmark supplement applies to those today, so the IBORs are obviously of the, the definitions related to the IBORs are contained in the 2006 is the definitions to which the benchmark supplement applies. Uh, ultimately, once the IBOR fallbacks are published, um, the idea is that will supersede the operation of the benchmark supplement, so you'll have a first order of fallbacks relating to the, the IBOR fallbacks uh, supplement or, or, or however that's ultimately published before then falling back to the, the fallbacks contained in the benchmark supplement. I appreciate that's a little bit complex, um, so apologies. Focusing on the IBOR fallbacks work specifically, so in 2014, uh, the OSSG, as I think was mentioned earlier today, published uh, their market participants group final report um, and that found that in most cases, fallback provisions within contracts are not sufficiently robust to cater for a permanent cessation um, of a key IBOR, such as your IBOR, which acts as a reference for over 150 trillion euros of uh, financial products. In July 2016, uh, the OSSG invited ISDA to participate in its work to enhance the robustness of derivatives contracts referencing those key IBORs, and as I mentioned just now, is they're undertaking work to amend the 2006 definitions to implement fallbacks uh, to a range of key IBORs which are on the slide here and I suppose most relevant for this group, uh, Euro IBOR and uh, Euro LIBOR. So how will they work? So the IBOR fallbacks, as I mentioned before, are designed to be used upon the permanent discon discontinuation of the relevant IBOR. Um, so as we've been developing the fallbacks, one of the things that became very clear is it was, it was really important to get a consensus and an agreed position as to what is meant by a permanent discontinuation. Um, and it was clear that that needed to be, or operate, 
um, as a predetermined and objective contractual trigger in order to avoid confusion in the market around when a, tr when a, a fallback or when a disruption or when a permanent discontinuation had actually happened. Because you think if certain parts of the market consider that a discontinuation has happened and others don't, you may lead to market fragmentation and probably exacerbate um, some of the, the market disruption um, around the potential discontinuation of, of that IBOR. So the triggers, what are they? So the objective triggers that, that we've come up with, um, we, we've worked with our ISDA, the relevant ISDA working groups to come up with these, um, two triggers. So one, a public statement or publication of information by or on behalf of the administrator of the relevant IBOR, um, announcing that it has ceased or will cease to provide the relevant IBOR permanently or indefinitely. And then the other trigger would be a public statement or publication of information by a public authority, such as a regulatory supervisor, an insolvency official or a central bank, uh, which states that the administrator has ceased or will cease to provide the relevant IBOR again permanently or indefinitely. Uh, important to note that in both scenarios, that presumes that there will be no successor administrator that will continue to provide the relevant IBOR. So we're talking about a scenario where the IBOR has permanently discontinued and there's no replacement administrator that's willing to take over the administrative function um, with respect to that rate. Also important to note that the fallbacks themselves won't actually kick in until the actual discontinuation of the rates. So if you consider a scenario where there's an announcement that an IBOR may be discontinued at some point in the future, uh, the IBOR fallbacks wouldn't be designed to kick in until that rate is, is actually discontinued again in order to avoid market confusion. So the fallbacks um, themselves will be the fallbacks to the relevant risk-free rates that have been selected in each jurisdiction. So in the euro area, that would obviously be uh, ESTER. Um, but clearly, there's some work to do there. The RFRs are overnight rates, whereas the IBORs have term structures and incorporate bank credit spreads and risk premium. Um, so for that reason, in order for the fallbacks to work effectively and in, in order to mitigate, mitigate against the risk of value transfer and further market disruption, it will be necessary for us to incorporate a term and spread adjustment to those RFRs uh, when triggering the fallbacks so that they can work as smoothly as possible. So in terms of how the contracts themselves will be amended, as I've said previously, is they will amend the 2006's the definitions, which is where the definitions relating to those IBORs are currently contained. The amendment will, um, the amendment to the definitions will incorporate those objective predetermined triggers that I mentioned earlier, and it will also incorporate uh, the fallbacks that will apply with respect to each rate, each IBOR, um, upon the occurrence of that trigger, so the fallback again being to the relevant RFR, as adjusted to account for any uh, term and spread adjustment. Um, as with the benchmark supplement, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, important to note that once the amendment to the 2006 is the definitions um, has been published, they will only apply in respect of new transactions going forward. So it will be necessary for ISDA to publish a protocol which uh, will have the effect of amending existing transactions, referencing those rates um, to incorporate uh, and to ensure that those IBOR fallbacks are in place. So how will we determine, I suppose, those uh, term and spread adjustments? Um, as Dominique mentioned, um, ISDA have uh, published a consultation on, on 12th of July of this year. Uh, we launched a market consultation of both ISDA and non-ISDA members in order to determine the methodology that should be used in calculating the appropriate spread and term adjustment for each of the IBORs. That consultation closed last month um, on the 22nd of October and ISDA is currently analysing the results, um, the responses, to determine uh, what approach that we should take um, in each instance. So we intend to publish a full explanation of how we made our determination. Um, we expect to do so by the end of the year, although that's not set in stone. Uh, we will, before doing anything, we will publish the final approach for review. Uh, we will publish uh, information around how we made the determination as to which, um, which of the various methodologies should apply. Uh, we will do that, as I said, before we actually go about making any adjustments or amendments to the relevant documentation. So for this audience, I think it's, it's important to note that the consultation, although it asked some preliminary questions around your IBOR, it didn't specifically cover that rate because, as you see, July 12th, um, when, the mark, when the consultation was published, the identity of the euro risk-free rate wasn't yet known. So now we know that it's ESTER, um, and we anticipate that next year, once ESTER is published, that we'll launch 
a supplemental consultation covering Uribor, um, and we will conduct that in the same way as, as we have done. So, so that's something to, to look for next year. And I think that's everything for me. Thanks very much, Kjaran. So may I remind you one final time that now we will have questions and answers. So if you want to put a question, you can still put it on Mentimeter. Yeah, and to allow for some yeah. time for that, uh, maybe a short wrap up of the of the session. So this time, positive news from from Alberto, and yeah, as a working group, we are extremely happy with that because it would be a massive task if we also had to replace Uribo. So thanks for the hard work, and hopefully it will indeed be a, a full success. So we expect somewhere half first half, end of first half, maybe third quarter, uh, here positive news. Uh, and that's good because uh, Michaela already made clear that despite Uribor probably surviving, we still need to have a plan if it ceases to exist. So we need to have plans in place as of all the contracts we have closed as of the first of 2018. Sometimes there are some confusions about that, but it, that is the case. And also for legacy contracts, contracts before 2018, we have to do this on a best effort basis. We have to be ready for a potential transition. Massive task, uh, not so easy to perform. Also, since we don't have these fallbacks yet in place, so it's, it, it would really help and when, when we have done our work, so we fully realize that. But already making the inventories is, is very important. Um, luckily, Dominique with the working group is uh, doing a lot of work on creating that fallback. So that is uh, uh, our reaction to yeah, getting also these fallbacks in place. Uh, looking at the outside world, very important, uh, looking at the regulations, looking at the F uh, FSB, but also with the, 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 the worldwide uh, RFR working groups like the, R like the ARC, like the, 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 the Sonia working group, but also the Swiss, the Japanese, we have now contacts with all these working groups. Work is progressing, so we have already identified the selection criteria, very important, and also we identified the various alternatives. Not so easy. Also, since we don't have a working derivative market yet, eh, so we have to do the work all under the assumption that the derivative market will be there once we start publishing Esther. Uh, and the consultation will also go out on this one, so watch out for that one. And then, of course, very important, Kieran talking about the ISDA in the fallback language. Uh, a very good example, so a lot of work has been done on ISDA. Also, yeah, it's, it's for derivatives, but of course for us it's also very important that we have fallback language that is consistent across our products, uh, because that would mean that in the end we don't end up with a basis risk. So the work on, on ISDA side, yeah, for me it's very important to also that it should be a sort of template for fallback language that we have on other products, so that we at least can fall back to the same benchmark. So a lot of work there. Uh, very important that it will be based on the new RFRs, like Esther, so that is also very positive. Um, but still, yeah, we need spreads. We need spreads for term and credit spread risk, so also complicated task there. I think the main conclusion also of the day is there is a lot of work also for you guys, because I think there will be three to four consultation papers uh, heading your way. Uh, so it uh, will be a busy Christmas time and first quarter of the year. So we hope to get a lot of feedback from you, because we fully realize that we can think about nice solutions, but if the market, and that is you, does not accept our solutions, yeah, we don't make uh, stand any chance. So thanks for your reaction already now. Thanks, Jaap. So, uh, Philippe, could you tell, give us a few questions that you have collected? Yes, um, the participants have been very active. So a uh, first question is, um, I sense a lot of interest in the uh, preparation of EMI for the phasing in of their methodology. Maybe uh, you could elaborate a bit more on that point. Also, what how you would cater for the spread um, in that in order to ensure a smooth transition. So as I said, uh, so Emmy is planning to conduct this phased uh, transition from from the current methodology to the to the new methodology starting in in 2019. So we are in close contact with. Uh, so again, I mean, this is all being done in uh, close collaboration or discussion with the FSMA. Uh, at this point, I mean, the information that uh, is public is basically what I just said. So we're still trying to refine uh, the details of that of that phase in. That phase in is, in pre is also, um, so first we need to guarantee that the banks are operationally ready. So the phase in will allow for that and also in order to minimize any 
impact, we are trying to avoid a big bang implementation, as it, I mean, it was planned to, to be done in the case of the pre-life, uh, well, the Euro plus, the fully transaction based. So again, so we are planning to, to conduct the phase in over 2019, apply for authorization by Q2 2019, and have uh, the hybrid methodology fully implemented by the end of Q3 2019. Second question relates, uh, is probably more for Dominique, it, it's the question how long uh, you estimate that it would take to develop a, a term structure based on Aster and what would be the role of the transition or the, the relevance of the, of the Eonia Aster transition in, in that process, what, how critical it is? Uh, the implementation phase will uh, probably take uh uh, you said uh, a few months. This is part of the work we still have to do to see, uh, uh, I don't know, to look for an administrator, to work with uh, with the platform suppliers, etc. So uh, it's very difficult for the moment. We have a timeline in terms of um, the work group, but then for the moment it's very difficult to assess uh, how long it will take. Which is certain is that um, the quicker, uh, as I said, uh, the quicker is a transition. Uh, the, the quicker Esther can have, uh, we can have a de uh, liquid derivative ma market on, based on Esther, the better it is. If uh, at the end of the year we have a, a, a liquid derivative market on, uh, on Esther, it means that the fallback could be, uh, could be computed. We have the methodology, so we just need the underlying. So that's, uh, that's the answer I can, uh, I can make. It's very difficult to say take one, two, three months, one year, two years, I don't know. It really all depends on the um, on the Esther uh, the derivative market, and and probably also on the, on the transition path that we will choose, yes. eh? because then yeah, if, if it will see if Ionia will cease to exist or not or be fully linked to Esther, yeah. we will force the liquidity probably in the in the OIS market towards Esther derivative. So that would make a a, 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 a yeah, the conclusion of a, a derivative market quicker. If it would run in parallel, yeah, you could still have a dispersed market. So yeah, we're looking at those al alternatives. Then we have a lot of questions on, on the numerous consultations that are announced. So um, I th think there are two, two questions. Uh, what these will be used for, whether they will have be used also um, by regulators in enforcing one uh, change in one direction or the other. And uh, there's a call for a bit more of coordination in, in, in this uh, consultation process. So is, um, I think that's one of the questions. Is th can the number be reduced? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. But <coughs> uh, uh, <laughs> the, the problem is that our timelines are still very tight. Uh, and this problem is massive. So yeah, we, we have to take the market by the hand in showing in full transparency the work that we do. Uh, which means that we need to also cons consult uh, make the consultations on the various topics. Yeah, that forces a little bit that we have a multiple con uh, consultations coming out in the beginning of the year. So apologies for that, and, and we fully realize it. But I still think it's very important that we, that we reach out to the market because you have to know where we are, what our th uh, thinking lines are. It also helps you in your preparations. Uh, so it will be very difficult to, to, s to s not do these consultations or only do these uh, uh, one after the other, because then we will run out of time. Uh, th the 1st of Jan 2020 uh, is there quite quickly. Um, probably just another point I would mention. I think although a, a lot of these consultations, I think, look superficially similar, some of them are driving at slightly different things. So um, some of them are looking at transitions, some are looking at, at fallback. So I think it's um, important, I suppose, to understand what the consultation is actually trying to achieve and the objectives behind it as well. Then there's also a question on whether the development actually of uh, fallbacks um, might not lead to uh, an outcome where those markets become more active and are detrimental than to, to the new Uriba rate. So where the market pa participants have then a preference to move directly to those, those fallbacks rather than stay with Uriba. Can be. Uh, uh, 
and, and just so so for now we are very very happy that that Euribor is still uh, will will yeah will likely or hopefully be uh, uh, BMR compliant. If we see more activity in our fallback solution, uh, and that can very well happen because also yeah internationally we see the developments that they are more uh, pushing towards uh, term structures based on on risk free rates. Yeah, that can also be a development that we see on euros at the in, in the euro landscape. And I think we would be perfectly happy with that. So f I think it would not be necessarily be bad. I mean, I think that the spirit of the FSB, the recommendations were not only, uh, it was not so much about, I mean, it was about having alternatives. Mm -hmm. So I think that right now there may be an even that over-reliance on your IBOR, and that's why we are here. Mm -hmm. So that's why there is a systemic risk. So, I mean, having an alternative and starting using other, other benchmarks, at least, I mean, I don't think that uh, it is necessarily a problem. There's also a question on uh, who will be the administrator of the new um, term rates and uh, how that, uh, was it as a process for determining this, how, how that will be led, that pr procedure? Um, the, the work group has not yet uh, decided exactly uh, what will be the procedure for that. We have uh, administrators in our work group, work group two, uh, very well represented, but uh, for the moment uh, we have not uh, really uh, envisaged that question. Um, that's it. We have time for like two more questions or are you basically done? I think I covered most. Uh, okay. some, uh, some are questions that do not relate to our, our home turf, so the euro area, so I would like I, those need to be addressed to other uh, entities, and there was a more practical question whether the material would be made available that we show here, and um, I think we can say yes. Yes. Um, all the slides, presentations will be uh, available on our website. Thanks, Philip. Okay, then I'd like to thank the panelists very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.